Geek Therapy Radio. For those interested, the bump music today is a cover of Coldplay's Fix You by yours truly. For those that want to skip ahead, the podcast starts at 2.50 and the title topic starts at 16 minutes exactly. When you try your best but you don't succeed When you get what you want but not what you need When you feel so tired but you can't sleep Stuck in reverse And the tears come streaming down your face When you lose something you can't replace Oh, when you love someone but it goes to waste Could it be worse? Lights will guide you home And ignite your bones I will try to fix you In high up above or down below When you're too in love to let it go Try, you'll never know just what you're worth. Lights will guide you home and ignite your bones, and I. Welcome to the Geek Therapy Radio Podcast. I am, of course, your mental curator, Johnny Hemberger. Uh, remind you, mental curator, where did that name come from? Well, it's just something that I called myself one day a few years ago to introduce the show. And what I think of is that I am a mental curator. I, You walk into a museum, I am just the curator in the museum of the mind. What does a curator at a museum do? The curator of the museum is not an expert in any one exhibit, but they can show you around, tell you a little bit about each exhibit, maybe get you excited about an exhibit that you come across, know enough to get you excited, and maybe you want to hang back at that exhibit, maybe stopping by that exhibit and learning a little bit about that exhibit sparks a lifelong a fire in your hearts to learn about that exhibit. So if we stop by the uh, mineral section of the museum and all of a sudden you're all fired up about minerals, they're minerals, Marie. Uh, who knows? So that's what Geek Therapy Radio is all about. That's why I call myself the mental curator because we just explore different things. You just Every time you turn on the Geek Therapy Radio podcast or you listen to the radio show, it's kind of like stepping up to a museum. What kind of exhibits are we going to explore today? Maybe it'll trigger you to have a new geek thing. Maybe I'll touch on a subject that you yourself are an expert on, and maybe you can email me or let me know um, any more about that subject. Maybe that's your geek thing, and that's what you... uh, that's what you like to share with others. Um, or you might learn about something new, like I mentioned, and, and take that to heart. And, and it might get you on a path of learning and exploration. Uh, we're going to talk about the James Webb Telescope coming up here in a minute. Maybe it'll get you sparked on astronomy. Maybe at the end of the day, at, after listening to the podcast, for whatever reason, you'll say, you know what? I am going to go on Amazon and buy a telescope. If I remember, 
Uh, let's put a pin in that. I'll tell you about telescopes and what to kind of look for as an amateur. Right? I, I am an amateur astronomer. I do amateur astrophotography from time to time. Some of the best pictures I've ever taken in my entire life were of the moon and Jupiter uh, at, what is it called, o- occultation? O- occultation, where they're both, I got them both in the same frame. Jupiter was just over, was very close to the uh, surface of the moon in the eyepiece and I was able to capture them and the picture together and you know you see all the details of the moon and you see the actual if you look close at the photo and I've blown it up to poster size you can see the layers of the atmosphere of Jupiter so anyways I'm an amateur astronomer and maybe I can put you down the the right trail of of what telescope to look out for if by the end of this podcast and talking about the James Webb Telescope, you are so inclined to do so. Um, real quick, thank you for sending me your listener emails. I really, 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 really do enjoy um, getting them. I've got a few over the past few days, one referring to Computer Reset there in Dallas and the ongoing situation uh, there. The owner has recently passed away, so the family is deciding, has to go through all that rigmarole, deciding what to do with this big warehouse. Um, I'll include a link to the podcast or to the show below of um, when I had Clint from uh, Lazy Game Reviews, LGR. He went to Computer Reset in Dallas, and we talked about that for, I don't know, however long the show was. I'll include a link to that in the podcast description below. Also in the podcast description below, because a listener emailed me about this recently. Just reminding you that if you like the bump music, I used, I think, I used Zelda bump music, uh, covers of Zelda songs, uh, in the last broadcast, and the listener uh, reached out to ask about where to find those, how I find the music, where to find the music. Just a reminder, in the podcast description, I always include the links of t- to the music, to where you find the music, where I got the music, and nine times out of ten, it's uh, somebody's YouTube channel everything musicians load all their stuff to youtube nowadays so most of the stuff comes from the youtube channel and it's just me kind of scanning around looking for stuff oh that sounds cool so in the podcast description is the link to where i get the music so make sure you go and support and uh, support the artists there subscribe to them if they're the youtube channel or if they have a spotify or anything like that but that's where you find all information um from the show as far as bump music sometimes when i uh, talk about a specific article or i quote a specific person i'll include the link down below if just pop it into my mind right now is uh, i talked about um mckeller danica danica mckeller she played uh winnie cooper on the wonder years i haven't had her on the show but i was i want to have her on the show um, maybe I should get on that. But anyways, I talked about a, a research paper she did, a mathematics research paper that she did with a few other students. And I put a link to her papers as a PDF to her theorems in, in the papers down below of that podcast. So if I do something specific like that, just check the podcast description. Uh, and while I'm at it, before we get to the James Webb Telescope, uh, I don't plug this enough. Uh, Patreon. Uh, who, uh, Mike... Let me go. Let me go ahead while I'm here and log into the Patreon and just give a shout out to my Patreon supporters. No duck, duck, go. Why are you doing that? I have uh, just a few uh, Patreon supporters, so let me do a shout out to them. Uh, it's I. I, I don't. I don't plug the Patreon um, enough. Let's log in here because it's at the end of the day, it's it's up to you. It is your. There obviously there's no obligate to support me on Patreon, uh, but I will just remind you that uh, f- what is it? Uh, at least ten percent of the proceeds that I make every month go to helping uh, mental illness, not re- research, but mental illness help and those kind of charities. Well, yeah, of course, research as well. Uh, mental illness is a very under. <sighs> It's an underserved illness, I believe, still in this in this country. As much as we do for it and as much as awareness as we put out there for mental illness, I, I, I don't think that we'll ever reach a point where it's enough. I mean, even if it's well, well served, I, I still don't think that it will ever be enough. One of the, the problems in, is that we treat mental, we tend to treat mental illness um, like, hey, just buck up, buckaroo. 
Just feel better. What? No. If you break a leg, you don't tell somebody just to feel better. No, you get the leg fixed. And it's, there's no shame also if you have the broken leg to getting the leg fixed. There's no shame in seeking help if you do suffer from mental illness. So that is one uh, way that uh, that is one of the things you help support when you uh, support the Patreon. So thank you very much to Mike, Jamie, Asaf. Thank you guys for supporting me on Patreon. The Patreon link is in the podcast description if anybody else would like to go there. Um, maybe I should address, and I put a timestamp in the title or the description to when we get to the James Webb Telescope, but I should just address kind of what I would use the Patreon for. Uh, right off the top, the percentage goes to helping those with mental illness. The rest is going to be to help with expensive uh, expenses, you know? So what if I, like for instance, I'm trying to build a new uh, computer right now. Uh, I'm using any kind of extra proceeds that I get through earning money on YouTube channel. Um, I may use Patreon money if it ever gets to the point where I could do such a thing. So things that go into the podcast, things that go into the radio show. Uh, one of the promises that I that I made, uh, also it would go to other kind of life expenses. Let's say something happens in the future and I need to buy products regularly for whatever reason, it would go towards helping around the house. Um, uh, so so there's that too, uh, uh, just being just helping you know where your where your money would go. Ultimately, it would help me to do what I do, and I'd be eternally grateful uh, for that. So anyways, just to let you know what I'm up to, I'm trying to build, and this is not necessarily with pay, uh, Patreon money, but it could be, um, any extra money I make, so uh, specifically now with the YouTube channel, I'm trying to build a new PC. I do a lot more work now, uh, not just with audio for the podcast and the broadcast, uh, but video work for YouTube. And while my system from 2014, which is an i7 4790K, 32 gigs of RAM, a GTX 980, it's no slouch. It still gets the job done now. Where it where I start seeing its age is when I'm rendering out these projects, exporting these projects, and it takes a very long time. Four cores, eight threads. It gets the job done, but I would much rather have more cores uh, to render out these projects much quicker so I can just get done with my work and then get back to my family, get back downstairs to my wife, be, not be stuck up in the man cave the whole time waiting for things to render and such. So I'm, I'm trying to build a new uh, computer, and, and the way I'm paying for that is uh, through any extra money uh, earned through YouTube, uh, perhaps some from the Patreon Um just stuff like that. Also, to let you know, I will never advertise the Patreon. At least there's no plans to right now because I just can't justify in my head how I could do this uh, ethically. I would never advertise the Patreon on the radio broadcast. So if you ever listen to the radio broadcast, I just don't feel it's right that I would have commercials in those radio broadcasts and then tell you to support us on Patreon. Maybe there's nothing unethical about that. I, I know there's plenty of other uh, outlets that do something like that. They'll tell you to go visit their merchandise store. They'll tell you, tell you to go do all these other things. They'll inject, inject these ads for, out, th for third party companies and then tell you also to go to the Patreon. That's fine. I, I don't, I personally don't think that's unethical. But given that I have a radio show, a commercial radio show, uh, under contract with the with the FCC and abiding by the FCC's rules and all that kind of stuff, I just don't see how I can say, hey, listen to four minutes of spots in between each segment, and now that you're back from commercials, you should go visit, you should go support me on Patreon. I just, I just don't think that's right for the radio listener. The podcast listener, I will plug the Patreon every once in a while to remind you through that because the podcast isn't going to be filled end to end with you know 15 minutes of commercials breaking up the show yes there may come a point where there's a minute uh, of commercial here maybe two minutes in the middle who knows i'll kind of stagger it out to kind of do, do the best by you the listener uh, as far as as content is is concerned not just bombard you with secret advertisements and things like that or take payment just to, to talk about a product or something like that no you'll you'll always be kept on board and abreast of what I'm doing here on Geek Therapy Radio as far as sponsors and advertisers are concerned. So anyways, podcast description. 
the music, the Patreon, any pertinent articles to what I'm talking about, like today, I will get to the James Webb Telescope story right now. Uh, this came across my eyeballs uh, on Ars Technica. Ars Technica is a, is a great website. I often peruse. It's one of my go-to websites to peruse for what's kind of going on in the world today. Uh, and very often I find some techy geeky stuff over there on Ars Technica. Another one I use a lot is called New Atlas. Um, popular Mechanics sometimes or other times people just tell me stuff. Um I go off on a, maybe I'll save the tangent for the end, but I, I was cruising through Twitter today and I, you know, I, one of the people I follow is Barnacles Nerdgasm. Uh, I've talked about having him on the show. I got to get back on it. I've talked to him about coming on the show. We just trying to get something set up there. So anyways, he was talking about the resurgence of retro video games because modern video games are great, but you always have to wait for them to load. There's always updates. You can never just turn on your PS4 or turn on your PC and just play a game. Well, I, know, I know you can, but very oftentimes you have to wait for updates. Oh man, I finally get some time to, for a nice good gaming session. Oh, I gotta wait for the game to update. And in retro games, you just turn on the game and play. That's one of the benefit of retro games. Uh, but anyways, the James Webb Telescope. I have talked about the James Webb Telescope uh, quite a few times over the past three years here on Geek Therapy Radio because, I, like any other astronomy geek, I I just geek out at the proposition. Basically, what it is is it's just a souped up, super souped up Hubble taste Hubble Space Telescope. You know how we all know how great the Hubble Space Telescope is. It was launched was it 1990 early 90s, 1991, and all the images that it has revealed to us from deep space and continues to reveal to us from deep space. The James Webb Telescope will dial all of those functions up to 11. It is going to give us the deepest looks at uh, deep space, um, even planets in our own solar system. It's just going to, it's going to be so great. The images it's going to return to us and the data it's going to return to us, both in microwave radiation, radio wave radiation, all the different types of radiations you can detect, not just what's visible to the human eye, but all other forms of radi space radiation. I, m my mouth is watering. My geeky mouth is watering at this proposition of the James Webb Telescope, and I can't wait for it to go up. So where are we at with the James Webb Telescope? Well... NASA says that it is, what is it, uh, the probability, it's trying to, it's going for a March 2021 launch date. And NASA says at this point, there's only a 12% chance of making its March 2021 launch date. And that more likely what's going to happen is they're going to adjust the launch date further back to July 2021. Now, you might be thinking, oh, you know, six months back in the term of in the terms of space launches and things, that's not too terrible. Well, here's the thing about the James Webb Space Telescope. It was supposed to launch 10 years ago. It was supposed to launch a decade ago, and the project was only supposed to cost $1 billion with a B. $1 billion. So, it's 10 years too late, and the project's running cost right now are... This this is always an estimate. The estimate always keeps up, keeps going up. But as of right now, if it were to launch in March 2021, the project's cost, the James Webb development cost, would sit at 9.7 billion dollars. That would mean it's 10 years too late and 8.7 billion dollars over budget. What is that? It's like 800 and something percent over budget. So you might be wondering why in the holy space. Space heck. <laughs> Space hell. Is it taking so long? Well, building telescopes is hard, and James Webb Telescope being the most advanced telescope humankind has ever devised or, or even attempted to develop, it is riddled with technical gremlins. Uh, so we're going to dive into that a little bit. What are at least some of those gremlins to paint a picture of why we are 10 years behind in eight, almost $9 billion over budget. So let's start with the meat and potatoes of the telescope. Every time I say meat and potatoes on this podcast, I just want a freaking ribeye and some mashed potatoes. Stay on track, Johnny. Stay focused. 
stay focused. It's because I haven't eaten lunch. I've had coffee and a and a banana. <clears throat> and I'm a little sick. So anyways, let's start with the actual uh, telescope itself, the mirror itself. The James Webb Telescope uh, mirror is 6.5 meters in diameter. That's huge. And since you can't just put a 6.5 meter uh, mirror on the top of a spaceship because it would be way too wide that just wouldn't be an economical use of space it has to fold it has to fold up and be unfurled once it gets out into space so this 6.5 meter mirror has many points at which it folds onto itself and it has to wait until it reaches an an orbit around the earth of about 1.5 million kilometers from the surface of the Earth. So, obviously, the reason why the Hubble Space Telescope is so great and why the James Webb Telescope, hopefully, if it ever goes up, will be all the greater is that you are not affected by Earth's atmosphere. Telescopes here on Earth, we can get very uh, detailed images from space and deep space. There have been major advancements um, uh, with telescopes, Earth-bound telescopes, including anti-vibration motors in the mirror. I think I've talked about this on Geek Therapy Radio before. You know noise-canceling headphones? The way noise-canceling headphones work is it takes whatever noise is coming into the headphone, whatever is being picked up by a microphone outside the headphone, and it takes those radio wave or those uh, acoustic sound waves, and then it pumps them back through your the speakers of the headphones out of phase, 100 degrees out of phase, which means that basically the sound waves are canceled out. There's no more energy or way less energy in those sound waves incoming to your ears because it's playing an out of phase uh, replication of whatever is around you into your ears. That's how noise canceling works. That was a very brief description of it, Uh, but the concept is very basic. With earthbound telescopes now, and probably space bound telescopes as well you have basically anti-vibration motors in the mirror that undo things like just the natural vibration of the earth maybe the earth's crust is constantly vibrating even just lava and ma- sorry magma it's not lava until it comes out of the crust uh, magma underneath the earth just plate tectonics itself there's slight vibrations in the earth that our telescopes are mounted to so there's little motors now in the more more advanced telescopes that basically put, take those vi- incoming vibrations and put them out of phase into the mirror so it keeps the mirror all the more stable. This has resulted uh, in much clearer images. Also what it does is those same motors use, uh, the telescope uses lasers that it blasts through the atmosphere and it detects vibration in the laser beams in the atmosphere. Because You know when you look up at a, a, a star and it twinkles? The star isn't actually effectively twinkling. It's just the air and the gases and convection and stuff of the Earth's atmosphere that is causing the twinkle and distortion of the light. So lasers shoot up through the atmosphere, detect the vibrations in the atmosphere, and relay that back out of phase to the motors underneath the telescope mirror to correct for those vibrations and the uh, disturbances in the atmosphere. So it's very cool what's going on. Telescopes are extremely high extremely high technology devices so the james webb telescope is going to be the highest tech telescope mankind has ever created and it's a 6.5 meter diameter mirror effectively that has to be folded up there are so there's lots of points of failure according to this article there's more than 300 single points of failure on the james webb telescope observatory 300 points of failure You know the saying that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link? You have 300 potential weak links here in the James Webb Telescope, at least. There are um, at least 50 major risks to the telescope that has to be addressed, especially before launch. Well, when else are you going to address them? Side note, the Hubble Space Telescope, when it was launched in the early 90s, required... A fix. It was not returning. They opened up the telescope and it was returning this terrible distorted images in the public. And NASA's like, why did we pay so much money for this? And it's broken. 
It's right out of the gate. It's broken. So they had to send another crew of astronauts up there to perform an EVA. EVA stands for extravehicular activity. It just means when the astronauts put on their spacesuits and go outside of the shuttle, space shuttle at the time, rip the space shuttle program, uh, they exit the shuttle and they fix something. So they fixed the mirror on and some other electronics on the Hubble Space Telescope. And it retur- that's when it started returning all the images uh, it's famous for today. So... They, NASA doesn't want a repeat of the space of the, of the Hubble telescope uh, issues, so they need to fix the problems on the ground. We have the big mirror, all that complexity, 300 single points of failure. Like I mentioned, there are at least 50 more major risks to the telescope that have to be fixed here on Earth. One of the things that's hard to do when troubleshooting a telescope uh, here on Earth and testing out telescopes uh, – deep space telescopes and, and uh, satellites here on Earth is that you it's hard to replicate space conditions. We have gravity here on Earth. We have, rel- we have shielding from solar radiation here on Earth, here in the atmosphere. We have atmospheric pressure here on Earth. So it's hard to simulate space, deep space conditions, outer space conditions here on Earth. So not only do we have to address these issues, fix these issues, make sure all these issues work, but we have to try to make sure that they're going to work in outer space. And so there's three, according to this Ars Technica article, and again, I will link it below in the podcast description. There's three main areas that are causing the biggest headaches here with the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. And that is, for one, bolts. Uh, Northrop Grumman is the main contractor for the James Webb Deep Space Telescope. Um, and Northrop Grumman, it's an air, it's an aerospace manufacturer. They found out that the bolts they've been using in the James Webb Telescope, they have been used in other projects and other missions. And those same bolts in other projects and other missions have been failing or malfunctioning. They have not been holding up well to the rigors of space and whatever other applications they've been using these bolts, these bolts for. So they've got a long way of building this James Webb telescope right now, and they have to take out at least 501 of these extremely specialized bolts and replace them with something that's going to work. It needs to withstand the strength testing. It needs to withstand... Uh, temperature fluctuations and and, and expanding and contracting. Northrop Grumman has said, hey, we use at least 501 of these bolts that we know that we now know are defective in our other missions and other applications. So, yeah, we got to go through there and not only test them and replace them, but replace them with something else that we feel will work better. So that's going to take a long time. Uh, another area of concern is that uh, grounding straps to the spacecraft's momentum flap came loose during vibration testing. I won't even pretend to know what a moment what a momentum flap is. Um, what it says is it's an act as it's a balance against solar pressure. This is according to the article here. It's a, it's a balance against solar pressure that could, this I'm quoting here, that could cause unwanted movement of the observatory while in orbit. So, yes, okay, solar winds and, and solar pressure, I get that. That can kind of, if you push the air of the telescope out of aim by even a nanometer, by even the most fraction of a millionth of an inch, it's going to result in an unusable image, unusable data. So, okay, I guess this momentum flap is, is meant to kind of buffer, it kind of cancel out that uh, wind, that solar wind and, and solar pressure. Anyways, the strap came loose during vibration testing. So that thing has to be fixed and there has to be a better solution coming up. Uh, there has to be a better solution in that area. Uh, the last thing that this article mentions as just an example of what uh, the problems facing the James Webb Telescope are is that a non-explosive actuator, and I'm quoting again, non-explosive actuator on one of its membrane retention devices did not fire as planned. These devices, which help unfurl the sun shield of the spacecraft, are supposed to be electrically redundant, but only one of the two mechanisms used to fire the actuator worked during the test. So basically one of the redundant systems failed during a test. 
Yes, that's why you have redundant systems in case one of them fails during spaceflight. But ideally, you would like to send it into space with all systems, redundant or not, working. There's going to be all... You can't just send a repair crew up to the James Webb Space Telescope quickly, at least, if at all. It's going to be way out there, and you can't just call... It's not like calling the plumber when your sink leaks. It is 1.5 million kilometers out in space. It's not easy to service. So you need to have these redundant systems, and you need to launch it with all those redundant systems in perfect working order. If a redundant system doesn't work at launch, then it's not a redundant system. It's just a system that can fail. <laughs> you can't have things fail on this thing. So anyways, there are 180 of those actuators that need to be retested and potentially repaired or reworked, or rejiggered before this launch. All of that rounds back around to the fact that NASA is only 12% confident that the March 2021 launch date will actually happen. They think they'll have to push the date back again. The James Webb Telescope story is one of those... For astronomy geeks and anybody who cares about our universe at all, anybody who's ever looked to a star and wonder, the James Webb Telescope has been the most tantalizing piece of astronomy tech in the past... Since the Hubble Space Telescope, it has been the single most highly anticipated endeavor that mankind has ever undertaken as far as 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 far as observable space exploration. And it's been held back by 10 years. So while NASA says it's 12 percent confident in a March 2021 uh, launch, we have a decade of letdowns. We have a decade of them pushing that date back. So my official stance with the James Webb Space Telescope is I hope to see it launch before I die. I hope that it doesn't get scrapped altogether because there could be a point here in the next few years where they say, scrap the whole thing. Start again from the ground up. It is we are we are it's already out of date. Like it, the, the technology on here is already obsolete. We're not going to send this up because it's going to be an obsolete technology by the time that it's even conceivably done. I know that's a bit of a, of a stretch of a statement to make. Um, if it is going to be so much better than the Hubble Space Telescope, which it has every right to be on paper, everything about it should be way better than the Hubble Space Telescope. Even if it's quote unquote obsolete technology, it's still going to be a thousand times better than whatever we have out there currently, and it'd still be worth launching. But these are all considerations to make. These are all things to think about uh, when discussing the James Webb Space Telescope. Do I want it to be released and launched? Absolutely. I, I'm I'm waiting, but I'm I'm also being a realist about this, and that yeah, okay. Mo we have there's no reason to believe that March 21st that March 2021 is going to come and go without a launch there, we have every reason to believe that we and that's what I'm saying we have every reason to believe that March of next year will come and go in the James Webb telescope space telescope is not going to be up there I have every reason to believe based on the track record that we won't see it in 2021 period but I'm hopeful I'm hopeful that it will go up next year. I'm managing expectations. That's a really, really good way to put it. As excited as I am personally, and astronomers around the world, amateur astronomers or not around the world, are, are as excited as we are for the James Webb Space Telescope to go up, we're managing expectations. This was a promise that was made 10 years ago that should have been up returning images and returning data a decade ago. In 2010, it should have already been up there. So, hopeful that it will go up. Managing expectations. That's, that's, I think, a good way to put it. Okay, so here's the fun part. No matter what does or doesn't happen with the James Webb Space Telescope, we all can do our own space exploration right in our driveway or backyard, and it's relatively easily attainable. No, we can't all have a 6.5 meter telescope in our backyard uh, and that the measurement of telescope ha is the diameter of the mirror it's not the, the the height or anything of the of the telescope it's how big the mirror is my telescope is an eight inch mirror that means the mirror is a circle and it's eight inch in diameter i can see 
I can see some cool stuff. The other night I went out with my wife and we're looking at the at some nebulas and star clusters um, out in the backyard. We have terrible light pollution uh, where we're at in Missouri City, but anyways, it, it's still fun. So no matter what we do waiting for NASA to do its thing and for this James Webb Space Telescope to go up, we can explore space on our own in real time. You can look out with your naked eye in real time and look out across the expanse of space and then you get all trippy thinking, I'm looking at a star a hundred million light years away so really i'm looking a hundred million light years in the past because it's taken light 100 million years to get to my eyeball so that star might not even be there anymore anyways anyways you can explore the cosmos yourself in your own backyard in your uh in in, in your own driveway your front yard wherever you want uh so anyways how do you do this obviously we all know you get a telescope but what i want to try to do just in brief is just kind of guide you along and, and what telescope you're looking for so if you cruise on over to amazon or whatever and pick up a telescope here's a budget kind of stuff and, and what to look for if you budget let's start there if you budget even a hundred dollars for a telescope you will get something very nice something that will get you started and something that very well you'll keep around i still have my smaller telescope it's a 4.5 inch or a four inch scope um, I think it was 150 it was less than $200 for the full setup. Uh, so if, if even if you stick to the budget around $100, even less than $100, you find these little three-inch scopes, what have you. They are mostly reflector telescopes. Reflector telescopes means it uses a mirror to collect a lot of light and bounce it into your eyepiece. A refractor Telescope uses curved lenses like binoculars. There's usually no mirror in a reflector, er, er, sorry, in a refractor telescope. It's just a series of lenses, lenses magnifying the image or collecting the light and putting it into your eye. Uh, the reflector reflects off a mirror. A refractor bends light through lenses. Those are the main differences. There's also uh, Schmid Cassegrain telescopes that. Uh, basically blend the two. It's a refractor and ref reflector kind of in one. Those tend to be way, way, way more expensive. The telescopes are also much more compact. Schmidt Cassegrain's are. Um, so what you're looking for and what I would recommend because it's the best bang for your buck is a reflector telescope. Uh, you should be able to get one and get you started. Should come with a couple of eyepieces, maybe a 20 millimeter eyepiece and a maybe a 10 millimeter or six millimeter eyepiece. The lower the millimeter eyepiece, the more magnification you get. But the more magnification you get, the less light you get. So if you're trying to look at a very dim, distant object and you think I'm going to put this smaller eyepiece in there and get more magnification, you won't be able to see it anymore. More magnification means that it will be more dim in your eye. Less magnification means it'll be smaller, but you'll see, you'll get more of the light to your eyeball. So start with a reflector. You gather the most light for the least amount of money. Uh, a refractor gathers less light, but produces a sharper image overall than a reflector. Will you notice it? Will the average amateur astronomer notice in their eyepiece uh, a sharper image versus a reflector telescope? Unlikely. Don't get too bogged down with all these terms. The big takeaway here is just to let you know that if you set a budget even for $100 for the hobby of astronomy, you can pick up a great telescope to get you started. You don't have to spend $2,500 on a telescope, $3,000, $5,000 on a telescope to start out. It's not an expensive hobby to get into. Look for, if you just want to get into it for not a lot of money, look for a reflector telescope for under $100. Also, I would suggest starting with what's called a Dobsonian mount or a Dob mount. Basically, that means that you are free to aim the telescope anywhere in, your, in the sky that you wish. Uh, the drawback to that is that as the object moves across you know, the field of vision in the sky as the Earth rotates, it's hard to track the object with a Dobsonian mount since it works 360 degrees. Um, the other kind of mount is an equatorial mount, and equatorial mounts require alignment. You need to uh, align it with Sirius or the North Star or a couple points of light, a couple stars, to line it up so that you can track, you use another little dial after it's aligned and calibrated, you use another little dial for when you, let's say you put the moon in your eyepiece and then you lock it into uh, its equatorial 
positioning, you use a little dial that you can twist that will basically move the telescope uh, with the movement of the stars and with the sky. So you don't have to constantly hunt for uh, the object that you are locked onto. It's just more, it's more rigmarole. And you can certainly learn how to do that fairly easily. But just getting started to bring it all back around, if you just want to get into, started with astronomy and see if it's something that you would like to do, uh, either by yourself or with your family, $100 or less. And what you're looking for is a reflector telescope on a Dobsonian mount. Usually what you'll find it described as is a three inch daub. That's the kind of the lingo. Three inch daub means it's a three inch reflector telescope on a Dobsonian mount. So I'm looking on Amazon right now as I'm talking. And here's a telescope for $48. It's, it's an Amazon choice. Uh, $48.99 here in the United States. It's called the Celestron 21024 First Scope Telescope. I'm not going to put, I don't have an affiliate link. I'm not trying, this is not an ad for Amazon. This is not an ad for uh, Celestron or anything like that. I'm just telling, I'm just trying to help you out with where to get started here. 50 bucks for a good 76 millimeter uh, reflector telescope. And it comes with at least two or three eyepieces. 76 millimeter reflector telescope. That's a, what is it? A few inches. That's going to be great for looking at the moon. That's where you start is looking at the moon in a way that you have never seen the moon before, probably haven't seen the moon before. You can look at uh, planets like uh, Jupiter for sure and Saturn for sure with a 76 millimeter reflector telescope. Um, I think I will leave the link to this in the podcast description. Again, there's no affiliate. I'm not going to make a dime off of it. It's just if you're curious and you want to just look at what I'm looking at here. Uh, I have the slight... One of the telescopes I have is the slightly bigger brother to the uh, Celestron 2124 that I'm looking at currently. Um, where is it at? It's uh, here it is. It's the what is it? 112 Orion. It's the Orion 10012 sky scanner. It's a little bit bigger, 100 millimeter tele, uh, 100 millimeter reflector telescope. This is my little scope. This is when I don't want to bring out my big giant eight inch, you know, five foot tall telescope. I want to just grab the little tabletop telescope, slap in an eyepiece and be on my way. Uh, I, I highly recommend it. It's a hundred dollars right on the money. It comes with a few eyepieces. It's a little bit bigger um, of, a, of a mirror that's going to capture a little bit more light. You can see a little bit more deep sky objects with here. But even that, this telescope I'm telling you about right now, the two of them that I tell you about right now, $50 and $100. And trust me, trust me, either one of those things will spark a fire in you for astronomy. It'll be as much as you might need. Maybe you're, it won't spark a huge fire in you, but it's going to be something cool. You hear some space news, something happening in the sky that everyone's talking about, meteor showers. or Actually, it's kind of hard to see meteor showers with a telescope. But anyways, uh, maybe some something's going to happen. The, the Mars is going to be at its closest approach to the Earth, whatever, in, in, in its orbit. You'll have a telescope at least in your home to whip out every once in a while if you're just not that fired up about astronomy and look at it. The flip side is you got into astronomy for cheap. You got really fired up about astronomy for cheap and you're only a hundred bucks into it. That's really, that's a great deal right there. And I love it when hobbies aren't very expensive uh, to get into. So I hope, hopefully that helped you out. Uh, I can tell you something right now that's 100% for free. Uh, with your phone. It's a it's an app. It's also on PC, Mac, everything. It's it's an app. It's a software called Stellarium. Uh, what is, how do you spell that? Stellarium. S-T-E-L-L-A-R-I-U-M. Stellarium. It is a wonderful app. Go to your Google Play Store or your, uh, 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 what do you call it? iPhone, on your iPhone or your iPad, the app marketplace. Why am I brain farting on what it's called? doesn't matter. Just look for the app anywhere. It's called Stellarium. And even if you don't have a telescope, that app is so cool for astronomy. Stellarium paired up with a telescope is a freaking miracle. So no, if you do go to Amazon and you buy a $50 telescope, a $100 telescope, no matter what telescope you buy, whether it's a reflector, a reflector, schmidt cassegrain whatever, uh, get even if you don't get a telescope, Stellarium. Get that app right now. It's 100% free. It is a freaking geek standby. 
even if you don't have a telescope. It's a super awesome app. Um, I think that's going to do it. All pertinent information will be linked below in the podcast description. Remember that you are loved. We're all geeks about something, so lean into your geek thing. You're worthy of love. You're worthy of giving love, receiving love. Maybe getting into astronomy will will just... Oh, man. It was so therapeutic for me. Any any time I'm going through hard times, I look through a telescope, and it just really helps put things in perspective, really helps put some awe and wonder back in my life. It kind of... It almost feels, this sounds corny, but it almost feels like space travel, that when I'm looking at Orion Nebula, I'm like imagining myself there. I I am there. I'm looking at it in real time. These are all images that you see on TV and you've seen in in movies and stuff like that, but you can see it right now with your naked eye. And well, with a telescope, at least you can see what it's doing right now, not just on a Netflix documentary. You can look at Saturn. You can look at Jupiter. And you kind of feel like you're detached from the earth a little bit. You, you feel like you're really, really away from your problems just temporarily. Like you can catch your breath just temporarily. That's what astronomy does for me. I, I love astronomy. And I hope maybe at least one of you listening will at least give it a try. You don't have to go out and buy the telescope. But at least give astronomy a, a try. Maybe go out to your yard tonight or whatever. And just look up at a twinkling star and just kind of like meditate on it for a minute just kind of think about it what is that ball of gas that's nuclear energy up there and just let your mind wander it's really a great thing uh so anyways thank you for listening to geek therapy radio podcast this was kind of a long one for me at least i try to keep these consumable i know a lot of other people do podcasts for an hour and a half two hours three hours something like man that's all fine and dandy but i try to keep these a little bit more consumable um yeah thank you for listening to geek therapy radio podcast take care take care of yourselves my geeks and i'll see you tomorrow